will not be moved. Hey, like a amen, brother. Hey, that's <laughs> all right. How's everybody doing? Great, great. Good to see you tonight. Uh, let's. Uh, we're going to sing "Because He Lives." Because He Lives. That's uh, page four oh seven. Let's go ahead and stand up and uh, go ahead and sing. Standing. You sing so much better standing up. We're going to do 407 and then 406, the page right behind him. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. And Savior lives because He lives. I can face tomorrow because He lives. All fear is gone because I know He holds the future and life is just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know. he lives and then one day I'll cross the river I'll find life's final war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future is worth the living just because he lives. It's interesting, this song right here uh, today, I heard it on the radio, if you ever listen to Joy FM, which is um, 90.9 over here, um, it's a contemporary Christian music station, and they were doing this little kind of face-off between certain songs, and one was a more modern song, and then they played this old hymn sung by David Crowder, and I loved him. I, was, I never heard that version before. And he did such a beautiful job. And I don't know. I didn't get to vote. I, never, I don't do all the Instagram stuff. But, man, I hope this song wins it because it's just a timeless, timeless song. All right. So The Solid Rock, another um, beautiful song. And I'm 406. Just one page back in your hymnals. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. 
the last verse. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, pressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. You know, I want to do this just because I'd love to hear him play, and he can play anything. The hymn right next to it, 405, not one we've sung in a long time. How many know the song called Have Faith in God? Ever heard of it? A couple of you have. Okay. Well, we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna sing a couple verses of it. B.B. McKinney wrote a many of these old great hymns. So it goes like this. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Does that ring a bell anybody now? Couple years singing that. Okay, let's do the second verse. Have faith in God when your prayers are unanswered. Your earnest plea He will never forget. Wait on the Lord, trust His word, and be patient. Have faith in God, He'll answer yet. Have faith in God, He's on His throne. Have faith in God, He watches o'er His own. He cannot fail, He must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Do the last verse. Have faith in God, though all else fail about you. Have faith in God, He provides for His own. He cannot fail, though all keep shall perish he rules he reigns upon his throne have faith in God he's on his throne have faith in God he watches o'er his own he cannot fail he must prevail have faith in God have faith in God Thanks, you may be seated. Thank you, Brother Dave, for playing those. Amen. Yeah. I mean, what a timeless truth that song is. I mean, just, just, oh, my goodness. This is so we need to take up an offering, don't we? Yeah, we've got more than three people here. Now. We have more than three. <laughs> Brother, we had more than three last week, and we did not take up an offering. You already put some in. Good for you. <laughs> You're, you're a good man, Skip. You're a great man. Here, let me move that. That's fine. It won't take long to step on You need to have a long prayer so I can find something to play for the offering. Heavenly Father, bless us. Keep us strong, keep us healthy, keep us in mind that we owe you everything.
Thank you, Skip. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I really, I really, really am. And, and nothing, absolutely nothing grows a church more than the fellowship. You know, the fellowship is, is one of the functions of the church. And, uh, you know, that early church, when you, when you read the book of Acts, they really, they really had the fellowship going. Now they, the Bible says they, were, they met daily, and they're of one accord. And, uh, I just, I love to read the book of Acts. It's, it's encouraging to me. Do you think that they got it, ever got discouraged in the book of Acts? I mean, they were being thrown in prison, and persecuted by the government, and and yet it just, it just made them stronger. So, I. Uh, Well, he left Paul for dead at like, Lystra and Derby. And, yeah. I, I've never been beaten to the point to a point that they thought I was dead. I've never been beaten by a Baptist. You know, I'm, I'm sure some pastors have been beaten, but uh, I don't know of any. <laughs> and, uh, but in other countries around the world, yeah, there's, I don't know if you know this or not, but in the last century, more, more Christians were martyred for their faith than all the previous centuries put together. Millions of Christians were killed for their faith last last century. So. And, and uh, in light of what's going on in America, it's just a matter of time until we begin to see more uh, more persecution. So, if you just uh, turn your Bible to uh, Matthew twenty-eight. Hello, Leah. I'm just going to read verse 19, Matthew 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, well, I just want to thank you for the church of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being a part of the church. We know that all of us became a part of the church when we were baptized. Because when a person is baptized, they're baptized into a local body of believers. And, and we know that that stemmed from trusting Christ as personal Lord and Savior. And so, Father, we just want to thank you for um, all those in uh, over 75 years that this church has existed. Uh, people who are part of this church who were saved and baptized. Uh, there are those who left. And if I might put it this way, Lord, if you'll allow me, they left to become missionaries. They're in other churches, they're in other places, ministering and serving. Father, we know that sometimes the role of a church may, um, may require that uh, people just stay for long periods of time. They stay in that neighborhood for a long period of time. And, and then there are people who, who just come and go. And... Uh, Lord, we're just grateful for, uh, for your work. We don't always understand your work. We don't always understand why things happen the way they do. But, Father, it's, it's your work, and we, we just want to thank you for this church. And Father, we just pray for your, your encouragement. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit who, who teaches, who counsels. Father, I pray that you'll counsel us at this time and just show us what the church is doing. And, uh, Lord, in those areas where we fail, I pray, Lord, that you'll convict us. And, Lord, we can ask for forgiveness. And we can uh, seek to do better. And, uh, Father, we know that through the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, we can do better. And I just thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing at this church, Lord, and, and for the church all around the world, Father. It looks like Satan is, is winning the battle on many fronts. But, uh, Father, we, we have to just stand on the B-I-B-L-E and, and know that uh, as we put on, the, put on the full armor of God that, that we can be strong, we can stand against all the wiles of the devil. And Lord, just bless these people. I'm thankful that I've had the opportunity to get to know these wonderful people here. And Lord, just minister to them and bless them. Lord, give us something tonight that uh, will just make us better people and, and bring us closer to you. And we'll thank you for what you do. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So you're familiar with uh, Matthew uh, 28, the Great Commission. And we know that uh, all authority was given to Christ. And, um, but then Jesus said to, to go, therefore, and, and to make uh, disciples of all nations. So uh, before you make disciples, you have to first evangelize. So we've got to bring people to Christ. <laughs> but it's interesting, Jesus never said, y'all need to go out and evangelize. You know. uh, he told us to go on the highways and byways and compel people to come in. But as far as him just saying you need to evangelize, he, he, he put it in other terms but not go evangelize. You know. But he did say that as you're going, you are to make disciples. And to make disciples, we have to first be a disciple. And discipleship requires that we are growing, that we're becoming like Jesus. But as we are becoming like Jesus, we are encouraging others to be like Jesus. And you think about your own relationship with Christ you have found that, that uh, your spiritual growth is not the result of what you have done all by yourself. I'm, I'm all for personal Bible study. The first thing I do when I get up in the morning, I'm going to read my Bible and I pray. I, I, I was taught that at a young age. That's very, very important that we have that personal time with the Lord. But you have to admit that as, as people have encouraged you, as people have prayed with you, as people have studied the Bible with you, that, that you... Um, have, have learned these disciplines. And I, I made a list uh, when I was preparing this of people over the years who discipled me, people who were there for me. And uh, some of them were deacons, some of them were just, just lay people, some of them were women. Uh, some of them, uh, I was a part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in college. And why in the world they ever elected me president of this group? About 50, you know, students at this college, I don't know, that um, I, I told him, I said, I'll be your president. But I said, you know, I, I'm just, I don't, I'm not feeling good about this. But anyway, they saw something in me I didn't see. But you know what? They came up to me and they prayed for me. And, and, and we did Bible studies together. And we, we did evangelistic uh, activities together. And I grew so much. And it wasn't so much what I did, it's what we did together. And you think about the church, you know. How have you grown spiritually? Well, you, you grow by being with brothers and, and sisters and you're you're in church with, with people and and I kinda agree with Margie, you know, it's just there's just something really special. I told Margie she needed to go out there and, you know, uh, be waving her hands and encourage people to come to church. He said it wouldn't do any good. <laughs> I don't know, if they saw you they might. They might come in. Yeah. <laughs> but but anyway she said, you know, we d- derive strength. And fellowship, and and hope by by being together, and uh, I like to think we're a few in number, but we're mighty in spirit. Amen. We're few in number, but but mighty uh, in in spirit. So when it comes to the functions of the church, and I've preached on these and, and shared on other occasions, uh, the five functions that that we're responsible for is evangelism, discipleship, uh, worship, fellowship, and ministry. And, uh, and so our focus right now has kind of been on, the, on discipleship. And um, you, as a church, you've been involved in discipleship. Sunday school basically is about discipleship now. Um, if you grew up Southern Baptist, so Sunday school was more about evangelism than it was discipleship. Because Sunday school, back in the old days, focused on growing the Sunday school uh, having contacts. Remember when you used to have a contact uh, role and you'd contact people and you'd invite them to Bible study? And, and I remember, particularly early in my adventures with uh, Southern Baptists, um, you know, we, we'd have contests between the Sunday school classes, see who could contact the most, make the most contacts, you know. And, and a lot of those people, though, were lost people. You know, it, it was easier. 30, 40, 50 years ago to get lost people into the church. It's almost impossible to get lost people in the church uh, nowadays. And, uh, you know, and, and if, if we understand correct, uh, church, uh, the Great Commission correctly, he doesn't say y'all come here. He says we are to go to them. And uh, so that, that says a lot to us. But, but one of the things we want to do certainly is evangelize. We need to bring people to Christ. 
But we want to make sure we are discipling people to teach them how to grow. And that means we are disciplined in and of ourselves. We are growing. And, uh, but one reason we are growing is so we can disciple uh, other people in, in, uh, in the faith. Uh, discipleship calls for 100% commitment. And uh, we all one day will stand before God and give an account of our lives. Um, but thankfully, thankfully, and I'm, I'm just speaking for myself, if I just get through the gates of heaven, it will be glory, glory, glory. You know, I, if I end up in the kitchen cooking food or sleeping the floors, it, it's, it's all right, you know. I just, I just want to get there, and I believe I will be there. You know, I think there's sufficient scripture to indicate that we can know that, that when we die, we're going to heaven. You know? and, um, but in this life, um, not only from Scripture, but just from within, don't, don't you sense that Christ is calling us to 100% commitment of our lives to Him? He, he doesn't, uh, even the church of Laodicea, Christ said that they were lukewarm. Well, I don't want to be lukewarm, you know. But I, I probably live my life a bunch of time lukewarm. Not many times, not because of my own choosing. I just, I just don't fully understand everything that's involved in, in, in growing as a Christian. And so I'm, I'm 71 years old, and I'm still, I'm still learning, still growing. I still need you. I still need the church. I need the Word. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm growing. And, and I'm thankful for that. I, I'm real suspect of anybody who tells me that they already know it all. And, and you know what? I meet a lot of Christians. And they said, I've learned all I need to learn to get me to heaven. That, that's, that's dangerous. That's a dangerous uh, area to be. So there's some uh, discipleship passages I'd like to look at. Uh, one, to indicate how costly discipleship is. So in Luke chapter 9... Luke chapter 9, look at verse 23. He, he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me. So that's, that's you and you and you. And I mean, usually it's people who desire to follow Christ who are in Wednesday night prayer meeting. <laughs> You're not going to find many other people coming on Wednesday nights. And he says, Anyone desires to come after me. What, what does he say? Verse 23 of Luke 9. Yep, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So in this life, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, have you not found that uh, following Christ requires the denying of your selfish warrants and desires? That following Christ requires sacrifice? Um, that following Christ, you... You, you're not dying on a cross like Jesus did, but um, you know what? We have our crosses to bear every day in our life, don't we? Those, those challenges that are almost insurmountable, and we kind of wonder how we're, gonna, how we're ever going to get through them. And, and so we deny ourselves, take up the cross, and we follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So this is not uh, about a desire to, to save our life. This is about our losing our lives. As we lose our life in Him, as we surrender our lives in Him totally and completely, then He works uh, so incredibly uh, in, in, our, uh, in our lives. Look with me at Ephesians uh, 4. Ephesians 4, verse, uh, begin, I'd like to begin reading at verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Here the Apostle Paul is uh, describing the positions of, of the church and their purpose. So he says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and, and teachers. And the reason he gave them, and this would include me as, as a pastor and a teacher, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So, so God called me, called Mike, any, any pastor, and they exist for the purpose of equipping you, the lay people, to, to do the work of, of ministry. 
In other words, the pastor doesn't have to do it all or shouldn't be doing all of it. Um, I, I preached a sermon years ago called the super hired holy man syndrome. And there are a lot of churches that call pastors and they expect the pastor to be a good preacher, a good pastor, a good fundraiser, a good counselor, a good janitor, <laughs> a good singer. He's supposed to have a good family life. He's supposed to tithe, even though the church may not pay him enough. But, you know what I'm saying? There's all these expectations. And so, you know, as this church, as you think about calling a pastor, um, realize that, that God calls a man, and he is a man sent by God, but he, he cannot do it at all. We, we're all in this uh, together. And, uh, and what does that do? Is, is, is God, is, is God uses the pastor to equip the saints for the work of ministry. It's for the edifying of the body, the building up of the body, until we all come to unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of, of God. So it's interesting that in this relationship between a pastor and the people, and as the church is built up, what is the result? Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Uh, in, in Jesus' prayer um, in, in the garden. Uh, what was his prayer? His prayer was that they would be one as he and God are one. And we sometimes wonder why there's such a, almost a divorce between the pastor and the congregation. And, and, and I'll tell you, it's because there's not the unity there. We need the unity. We, you've got to get, and I'm so, I, I so appreciate the search committee, because they want to get just the right pastor. And that's great. Keep praying for just the right pastor for First Baptist Church of Home Assassin. I hope that you will agree with me that God has just his man to come to this place. We cannot be discouraged, cannot give up. He has just the one. And, and whoever comes, one goal, one goal is indicated right here, is that we all come to a unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Amen? That's, that's just, it's just, we're not just trying to find someone to do a job. This is not a job. This is God's job. This is, this is God's work. And uh, we just want to see God work uh, in, incredibly uh, in every way. So there's a few things we, we need to realize when it comes to discipleship. Number one, discipleship is not an option. This, this is not something we can say, well, you know, it, it's, it's not really all that important um, whether or not every member of the church is living for Christ and being a disciple. It does matter. Remember, your church is only as strong as your weakest member. Your church is only as strong as your weakest member. And so God calls all of us to 100% commitment. He, he calls all of us to, to mature and, and, and to grow. So uh, number two, I want to say this. As you are being discipled, as you are growing as a Christian, you become acutely aware of the importance of, of holiness, holy living, righteous living. Uh, when you got saved, you put on the righteousness of Jesus. You're clothed in the righteousness of, of Jesus Christ. But I'm, I'm finding the last 20 years as a Baptist preacher, that Baptists feel uncomfortable talking about being a holy people. Uh, I'm sure you don't have a problem with that here, but a lot of, a lot of people, they really struggle when they think about it. You mean, you mean when I get saved, God wants me to live a holy life? You better believe it. <laughs> you better, he has called all of us to holy. He, he said to be holy as I am holy. And, and, and so, um, would you agree with this statement? That we're to be like Jesus? Everybody agree with that? Would you say Jesus was holy? Never been anybody more holy than, than Jesus on, on, the, on the face of this earth. And uh, so if we're going to be like Jesus, we're going to be holy. That doesn't mean we uh, put on a robe and we, and we live in a, in, a, um, in a temple somewhere or out in the middle of nowhere. You know, there's been a lot of Catholics that have done that. and even, There's been Protestants that have done the same thing. Uh, that's not the way God wants it. He wants us to be holy in the marketplace. He wants us to be holy at home. He wants us to be holy everywhere uh, we, we go. Um, 
Let me you have your Bibles turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. So in other words, in light of what I've been sharing with you, is God has called us to commitment. He's called us to holy living. He's called us to unity based on the scripture there in Ephesians chapter 4. He's called us to deny ourselves, to take up a cross and follow him. And so this is saying that we no longer live the rest of our time, the rest of our lives in the lust of the flesh, but how do we live? But for the will of God. And, and I've heard a lot of people in different ways say that all that matters for this church is the will of God. The will of God. And do we know what the will of God is? Anybody know what the will of God is? For First Baptist Church of Home Assassin? Huh? What's that? Take up your cross <laughs> and, and follow him. Yeah, yeah. And don and I yourself, take a cross and just and, and follow Jesus. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Yeah, I love, I love that. I love that. Yeah, there, there are things that occur that we just are not meant to understand. God's, God's got it. He understands everything. Discipleship uh, extends from ourselves to others. I, and I'm not really doing this justice tonight because there's, there's hundreds of scriptures, but I'm just trying to introduce you to some thoughts. If you turn to the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. In other words, when... When, when Christ disciples you, uh, as, as, as he's discipling us, we, that's, that's to expand, that's to reach out, that's to impact the lives of, of other people uh, as well. Um, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So this this. Scripture reminds us, and this is the very heart of, of Judaism. And oddly enough, it's the heart of Christianity, is it not? That we are loved. In fact, when, when Jesus summarized the, the law and the prophets, he, he said, he quoted this, about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then what was the second one? To love your neighbor as, as yourself. But, but notice... He says, these words, which I command you, shall be in your heart, okay, so righteous living, uh, spiritual disciplines begin in the heart, but what happens? He's, then he says, but you teach them diligently to your children, and you talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, wherever you go, when you rise up, and, and have any, uh, I, I know I've asked this question, anyone here has been to Israel? Okay, when I went to Israel, it seems like it was another life ago, it was 1983, um, we went to the Welling Wall, and there were the Orthodox Jews there, and they had these 
these little boxes that were hanging down on the side of, of, of their cheeks. And those are called phylacteries. And, and it says they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. They actually had the, a little scroll inside these and it had the Shema. And that was just a constant reminder to them of, of how they were to live. And uh, that'd be very distracting to me to have something that, I don't know, sometimes I think we need something spiritually distracting maybe to keep us in tune. You know? And when I say something distracting, I mean something that is there for the purpose of keeping us you know, in, in tune with, uh, with uh, the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And, and then it says, you should write them on the doorpost of your house and, and on uh, your gates. Um, if you came to my house... Um, you would know we're Christian people. Uh, they're just on, on pots, flower pots we have outside. There's some Christian sayings, you know. And you come in our house, and you really know we're Christian. I mean, there's crosses. There's all kinds of Christian artwork, you know. I mean, there's just there's no doubt about it. And so there's for Sally and me, they're just those constant reminders that Jesus loves us. He pours his grace upon us, and out of gratitude to him, we, we, we're going to live. And he died on the cross for me. The least I can do is live for him. Yeah. And, uh, so anyway, this is, what, this is what God wants us to do in this area of uh, discipleship. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it some more. And just want to encourage you during these days to just to be faithful as, as a growing Christian and to make sure that what God has has uh, given to you and um, that you give it away to other people so they can know. Like your grandkids. Uh, I got a picture right here of my, of my grandson that caught a 22-inch redfish yesterday. And my 20-year-old, he was, he's 14, and my 20-year-old grandson, uh, he caught a 20-inch redfish. And uh, do you think the fishing trip is just about fishing? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to preach that. They don't, they don't like preaching Paul. Paul. They, they, don't want, they don't want me preaching. But you know what? They'll let me share stories. They love to hear about the, the B-I-B-L-E. They like to hear that. And so it's wonderful. We were six hours on a boat yesterday afternoon. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. So, uh, so anyway, as God disciples you, grows you, Let's do it with others. Let's, let's help others in their walk with, with, uh, with Jesus Christ. Father, I just want to say thank you for the Word of God, for it's, the way it profoundly encourages us. And, and Lord, when we're encouraged, we need to encourage others. Uh, when you give us some spiritual counsel and food, uh, we need to give that to other people. Uh, when we see a brother or sister who is hurting, we, we need, in the same way that we have received encouragement and blessing and prayer from people over the years, we need to give that away. We need to put our arm around people. We need to encourage them and pray with them and show them scriptures that have been helpful over the years. Lord, we want to be a growing church. We want to be a church that continues to be a blessing to the community. And Lord, we're just going to trust you during these days. And I thank you. I thank you for what you are doing. Can't wait to see what you're going to do. You have the final answer of what's going to happen here. And uh, Lord, we believe it's good. And we just want to ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So thank you folks who are online. We had a few of our folks um, Sunday who had been home for months and months and months and they came to church. And so tennis looked, at, looked pretty good Sunday. And there, there were some pe people that we knew were out. A few people People in the back pew there. We, you know. Is uh, Jim's all right? And any Jim.